Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Footy Consultancy podcast. Today, we have a special guest in Fraser Stewart, who's the head coach for the women's national team. How are you doing, Fraser? Yeah, good, thanks. Good to be with you. Good man. I'll hand over to Carl and we'll get it going. Morning, Fraser. Are you okay? Yeah, good, Carl. Thanks. Yep. Brilliant. So, what we're going to start off with, we're going to, get, we're going to ask Fraser to run through his current roles and responsibilities with the Scottish FA. Um, he's currently head of goalkeeping and also the goalkeeper coach for the women's national team. So, Fraser, if you just want to run through what you do from a day to day basis, yeah, sure. It's um, when everybody asks me, the easiest way to explain it is probably anything goalkeeping related in Scotland or within the Scottish FA will always have my input, if that makes sense. So, I kind of we always split it into a few areas. So, there's the national teams I've just spoke about there, where at this moment in time I I travel with the women's A and the men's under 21s, and then just oversee the development of everything else there and below. Um, we have a performance school structure for kids aged 12 to to kind of 16, that fourth year at school. And um, so a four-year programme where I look after the again the development and provision of goalkeeping within that. So look after, I think at this moment in time, there's uh, three goalkeeping coaches within that programme that I look after. Um, then branching into to coach education, yeah. where at this moment in time, we've got um, two, two UEFA licence courses, and then below that, there's um, kind of a level one pathway, goalkeeping pathway, so looking after that whole pathway and the structure of it, as well as giving input to the the outfield pathways in terms of the goalkeeping modules within that. Um, and then that generally tends to be the main roles and then there's always spins off from that that you undertake. Yeah. We've got a, a mentoring programme with our, with our clubs. So all our kind of clubs who have academies here in Scotland, we, we mentor, we look after, we help and advise the, the goalkeeping coaches or the heads of goalkeeping at all our clubs in Scotland. So there's a whole mentoring programme based around that that you you meet with these guys yearly, albeit just now. We're not getting to do that with COVID, but hopefully very soon we can get them back together as a group. But there's a kind of mentoring side to it to there as well. So that, that's really the kind of main, yeah. the main phase of the role. I think with um, <coughs> goalkeeping in particular, it's a very specific skill set. Mm -hmm. What differs from a goalkeeper coach to, say, a conventional outfield coach is what you'll be looking to do is very specific to that position. How do you feel the main difference is between a conventional football coach and a goalkeeper coach? I think it is. I, th I think because it is, as you say, so individual at times, I think sometimes you're a bit more, when you're on the pitch, sometimes a bit more analytical because you are just looking at the individual and you're looking at the the small tweaks that you can make to the individual at that time. Um, so that, you know, that becomes your kind of main coaching uh, piece, if that makes sense, that individualness that you bring to it and how you develop the individual through, through if you want to call it the four corners and how you do that. Um, but then ultimately, you know, in the last, I would say the last few years, I've found myself as a goalkeeping coach actually being more... Um, more of what I would call like a hybrid coach. Yeah. Do you have the skill set of doing that, but you also have a skill set, for example, in how to manage and manipulate a back four, how to even at times how to break a back four down because you know what you don't want, so you know what goes against you. So, so I found myself in the last few years, particularly with the national teams, being a bit more of a, a kind of hybrid coach where yep, yeah, you, you look after the goalkeepers to a certain level, but you also have an integration towards the, the team ethic as well and how the, the structure of that goes. Yeah, because I think that's one thing with the, the evolution of football over the last 10 years and players such as Edison at Manchester City, they're an integral part of the back four. When they're playing out from the back, they almost become like a sweeper. So yeah. there's probably something that's developed over the last 10 years where a goalkeeper coach and the goalkeepers in particular need to have more of a thorough understanding of the outfield tactics. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's getting goalkeeping coaches to have that belief and confidence as well, that they can offer that advice and support. That, that's a big thing for goalkeeping coaches to, 
to kind of break that mould of no, I just work away in my wee corner here, and I'm quite happy there. It's it's within coach education we try and take them out of that comfort zone. You know the same you do as a player when you're trying to develop them. So we take them out of that comfort zone. We make them work with back fours, back fives, midfielders. We make them work in these in these kind of functional practices to again to try and develop the relationship between goalkeeper and back four or goalkeeper centre backs, goalkeeping. Uh, goalkeeper and, and fullback. So, because again, if you, as you guys, as outfield coaches, you want that relationship to be as strong as you can, and it's going to be the basis for a for a strong team for sure. I think the relationship between the goalkeeper and outfield players is something that sometimes goes under the radar. I think if we look at the four corner model, especially when we look at the social and psychological side, mm. goalkeepers will often spend a lot of time away from the outfield players. Yeah. And own small goalkeeper and group with a goalkeeper coach. Do you have any yeah. specific things that you use to try and develop that social and psychological side of it where they do have a, a strong relationship with the outfield players? I think there's, there's a number of ways, you know, even if you take it um, on the pitch now, I see benefit in a lot of kind of, uh, we we're talking about it off air, that micro sessions where go and have the, the goalkeeper and back four working together in kind of micro-based sessions or I would call them functional uh, sessions where you're working on like a um, defending against a 7v5 and the five have got to defend the big goal and it's overloads and it's constant defending and you're making them having to, to really do crisis defending and I think it builds it on the pitch. Off the pitch, I think, you know, if you have unit meetings within your analysis, I think is a great way to try and get the thoughts of the goalkeeper, the thoughts of the centre-backs, and you get them all speaking to each other. You know, I think that there's great ways in how rather than just doing analysis as a big team, how can you break it down into smaller unit meetings? I think you, you end up getting more discussion anyway because literally it's smaller groups. So I think sometimes players are a bit more open to speak within that environment than, than the bigger group. Um, so there, there are two ways in the past that, that I've certainly tried it. I think as well now with touching on the modern day goalkeeper as well, I think it's extremely important that a modern day goalkeeper is comfortable with the, the ball at the feet. Yep. In regards to a, a child's development through them phases, how often would you expose a young goalkeeper to play an outfield, be it in training or even in competitive games? I think, you know, if I look at our, our pathway in Scotland just now, so the kind of player pathway, there's obviously the fun fours that we have, so there's, there's no goalkeepers involved in that. They just play, it's for fun. They then uh, five asides. Again, there's no kind of what we would call a designated goalkeeper, Carol. It's um, it's like the old-fashioned backy, if you want to call it that. So they, they can play outfield, they don't have to wear gloves, they're just there. And again, the, the uh, positions tend to get kind of uh, rotated anyway. And it's only really come seven aside that you need to have um, a designated goalkeeper. Um, but I know up here in Scotland, there's been a number of good examples of goalkeepers who have been outfield players and then reverted back into being a goalkeeper. Some have been the other way around. I think just in general with kids, sometimes the goalkeeping position isn't, you know, the most favoured of position because it doesn't get all the headlines and everybody loves it and, and all that. So, Sometimes you have to be creative as a coach is how well how do I find someone who can attaches himself to it and loves it and wants to be that, or if I've not got that, then how do I find a way of whether it is rotation and things like that? But certainly um having the goalkeepers familiar with the ball at their feet from as early an age as possible for me is a paramount thing just because of the way the game is, you know. If if you're trying to get them to play in that way, I think it's a great way to develop that initially. You know, and I know in terms of, uh, I think it's Barcelona's academy, they're very like that, where they develop that area first. You know, they let the goalkeeping side of it be be natural, if that makes sense. So they just allow them to save the ball, be natural is how they want to stop the ball. But the biggest part they try and work on is, is the footwork part first. And in regards to, again, the child's development work and the footwork working on different aspects of the game, when would you start to maybe go down goalkeeping specific fitness side of it? So plyometrics, flexibility, or what age do you think that's necessary? Yeah, I'm always to and fro with this. Sometimes I think you've got to take the kind of maturation into account with it because some things you can't you can't control. You've got to wait until that 
really takes its effect on the, the kid. And yeah. sometimes I've found that being the best way, you know, and if I think back to my time working within the academies in Scotland, the only thing we would do before um, kind of that uh, maturation stage would just be body weight things. Yeah. You know, your, your typical press-ups, planks, sit-ups, uh, lunges, obviously they do, can do the hurdle work and things like that, fast feet ladders, the, the speed, agility, quickness stuff. So a lot of it was really that, you know, just to build a base of strength that yeah. you're not really trying to do anything really crazy with them. And then once, I feel once that's kind of took its toll on that maturation, then, then you can start to implement for me, a full-blown kind of strength and conditioning program. Um, I know on the, the license, the education side of it, that's what we push, that you build a base first. Yeah. And that base, you know, it can be, you know, it could be a, a squat movement, but they're just, you know, they're holding like a, a broomstick. They're not holding the, you know, that 20k bar. It's just nice and relaxed to get the movements first, that, those movement patterns. And then I think once they've hit that, that, that peak of their maturation and they're over it, then you can start to add in the, the proper strength and condition is what you would probably understand it to be. And what we'll do now is we're going to look a little bit back to how you started out. Sure. And what got you into the game, <clears throat> what inspired you to be a goalkeeper, and then how that transitioned into the coaching element. So the first one really was just say, what made you fall in love with football? What was your first memory? I think whether it's luckily or unluckily, depending on how people look at it, I was brought up in a, a family of goalkeepers. So unfortunately, we, we, um, my dad was a was an ex goalkeeper who played for uh, played for Middlesbrough. Actually, played for Middlesbrough and, and uh, yeah. uh, Kilmarnock. So he had he had a good career and um, played for Scotland. So he had a good career himself. I then had uh, an older brother who. We went into professional football as a goalkeeper. He started off at Ipswich Town and came back up and had a career here in Scotland. So whether it was a natural progression or not, um, just found myself, I think, just been brought up in such a, a massive footballing family that, you know, I remember my youngest memories is just going to games with my dad or um, when you were off school, he would take you into training, you know, so you're just always around a footballing environment. And I think that just that love started from there. And then obviously my first ever memories were going to, a, I think it was a Scottish FA kind of regional summer camp or something like that, where you go to as young kids and just that, that's it, you know, it starts from there. And then for there, you just go on your own wee, your own wee route, if that makes sense. But I think the general love affair started at that time and just playing with my brothers out the back door you know, playing funny shooting games and just different things. One thing that always sticks in my head is my, my dad at the time, I, I never was old enough or I was born too late to watch him play. So um, I only ever knew him as a coach. So at that time, he used to travel with the Scotland youth teams as a goalkeeping coach. And he would come back for tournaments with the, the match ball. So I always remember him coming back with all these match balls. So we, um, we used to go across the park and we would play with the the match ball that you come back with. And I remember one being the Adidas, uh, oh, Adidas Questra, it was called. And I can't remember the tournament that was used in, so. Was it um, France 98, wasn't it? Something like that, I think you're right. So I remember my brother saying, right, uh, let's do these free kicks. And you've got, if you hit the valve, you get more dip. So we're like, ah, right, okay, that's fine. And I'll never forget it. He's placed the ball down, he's went to hit it, and I'm no joking, it goes over the fence. <laughs> Over the goal, over the fence, and dips and hits were uh, hits one of the windows at our house and smashes the window. And we're going, I great dip, right enough, you know. <laughs> but just great memories of that of daft things like um, you remember building like a makeshift goal, you know, you know the metal out frame. Yeah, things like my memory of professional football was always the box nets. You yeah. know, so you would like tie it to the fence, so it was like a proper box net. So you felt as if you were. Uh, you were at the European Championship, so you were playing in the, the big leagues because you had these box nets, you know, and it was just incredible. Yeah, we, we, we were very similar. We would um, we would go to a school field, and if somebody had managed to get a hold of a football net, then we'd yeah. tie a bit of orange string onto it and tie it to the trees to try and yeah. put it out. Oh, 
Brilliant. Brilliant. You know, and just the things you used to do and you think, wow, you know, that's always my memory of making those those box nets, you know. Was there any professional goalkeepers at the time that inspired you that you used to look up to? Yeah, I think, you know, people always say that you, at that time you had, uh, you know, you had Schmeichel was around in Scotland, you had Jim Layton, you had Andy Gorham, who were incredible goalkeepers here in Scotland, you had Peter Schmeichel down south, you had Buffon, but I think because I was so lucky with my family that having input or getting access, sorry, to go in as a very young kid to Kilmarnock, I watched yeah. a goalkeeper there called Gordon Marshall, um, you know, not a lot of people might know, but Gordon had a great career in Scotland. And and I think because I used to watch him at Kilmarnock and I used to see him up close. So it was like, as a young kid, you're like, wow. So you're watching him training and doing things. At that time, he was at near enough the end of his career, but still a, a fantastic goalkeeper. And then I used to go to the games on a Saturday. So you would watch what he does, you know, and then you would go into training, maybe in the school holidays, and he would take time to speak to you and he would do wee exercises with you. So you felt a real you know, that kind of, this guy's great, he's brilliant, and and I think just something daft like that, so that always became uh, the goalkeepers that I've watched growing up, so when I, I used to go and watch Kilmarnock, so there was Bobby Geddes, another one, uh, Drago Lekovic, who was a Yugoslavian goalkeeper at the time, just a real, Kilmarnock at that time had a real knack for, for good goalkeepers, so I think just because they were there in front of me, rather than watching you know, football as much wasn't on the TV as much as it is now. So it was those ones who were live in front of me that I just loved, loved watching the saves they would make and different things, you know. I think as well, when you see them in real life, oh. it is taken compared to seeing it on the TV. I yeah. remember when I was, I would have probably been about 15 and I was at a Newcastle game. Yeah. And I think Shea Given pull off a save and I was quite close to the goal. And yeah. I couldn't believe it, like, when you see it in real life, when you see the distances and heights, these goalkeepers are jumping, it does take your breath away. And I yeah. don't think TV really demonstrates it and shows it. No, no, it doesn't give it any, especially now when you can slow it down and everything's slow cap. You don't see how quick these, these guys can react and have to do things, you know, and the agility that, that comes with that. But I agree with you, Carl, it was the... It was that access to seeing them live and you just think, wow, like, and again, I think that's where my own love of the position came from I want to be that I want to be able to do that I love seeing that you know and I think that's where where it kind of really started to grow for, for myself and were you in Kilmarnock's academy system no so again I played boys club right and probably right until I was about 15 16 I'd had I had played at that time you could play with your boys club and play I think it was in the Sunday that the youth teams of the professional players would play in a Sunday so you'd a kind of duel I know they don't allow that now, but you could do both, and I thought it was great. So sometimes I did. I played a couple of games for Kilmarnock's youth teams, um, and then eventually I uh, signed youth forms for Aberdeen, nice. um, and went into their youth program from I think around about the age of 15, 16. Um, How did you find that? Did you did you get signed on a scholarship? Yeah. So initially it was uh, I think S form, whatever they call them. So still at school. And, and played. Um, it was strange, you know, Aberdeen, I was from the west coast of Scotland, Aberdeen being up north, so they used to have a, a training base in Hamilton, which is about an hour and a half from where I stay, so I would travel in there and, and do training once, twice a week. And then obviously the game, you were either up in Aberdeen, there would be a minibus would leave at daft o'clock in the morning to, to get up in Aberdeen for the morning kickoff. so you would go up there every second Sunday, or you'd be down across the central belt at all the other clubs. So, and it was great. Aberdeen at a club where we're just really good, looked after all their young players who were so heavily invested in their youth. And really, at that time, they had produced a lot of young players into their first team. Ryan Essen, just being a goalkeeper, had, had progressed into the first team. So I think as a young player, he's seen, you know, Aberdeen were a club who gave youth a chance. Yeah. Uh, so that was always a great thing and a reason for signing it again before I decided to go into the scholarship programme, as you call it, down south. I had a, an option, I think, I could have went to Rangers, I could have went to Celtic, but um, the advice I got at the time was was Aberdeen have looked after you, and, and I decided that, no, Aberdeen's a club I want to I want to go to, so I so signed a, what would have been a two-year scholarship, but um, we call it a YT, it was the old YTS programme up here in Scotland, so, so signed a two-year contract there. 
that would have been around about 16 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So just when I, I turned kind of 16 and 17, so kind of fifth year at school, I, I done my fifth year at school and then finished and, and went in there in the that summer. How yeah. much would you say the coaching element of what you are experienced to as a player has changed compared to what you're delivering now as a coach? No, nah, it's, it's massively different, you know, but I still think that, you know, again, extremely lucky at Aberdeen to learn off of someone, Jim Layton was the goalkeeping coach at the time, and to learn off of someone like Jim was, was incredible. Jim's experience, his knowledge, the advice he could pass on to you, that the standards that Jim holds was incredible, and it really did drive you on. And, and um, But you look at it now, it was always, you would work with Jim for, let's just say, an hour it could be, and then you would go with the team to just basically do games or, or shooting. That was, that was what it was done. Whereas now, I think it's... It's just a little bit different. Managers want goalkeepers earlier. There's more practices where you're involved in, whether it be possession games, passing drills, um, building from the back exercises, even just defending exercises. I think there's so much more integration now that just naturally the goalkeeping coaches are are finding that, that the time you spend with the goalkeepers is becoming a little bit less. With you having... Like what we call a pedigree, and having people in your family that have already played professionally as a goalkeeper, yeah. did you find that as an additional pressure, or did you find it a help in regards to having that support? It's funny. I always my memories of um, sometimes I found it harder. I found a pressure because everybody, and I used to I always remember this. Everybody knew you as Jim Stewart's son. Yeah, you know, I used to laugh at that. You say, "No, my name's Fraser. It's no Jim Stewart's son." I used to have a laugh about that, like. But that is how you get referred to. Same with my older brother Colin, and you always get, um, well, because your dad was this, you'll be. That. And I, I did find, you know, I think if you look in the past of, of football, how many, you know, offsprings of the, the, the father that's been a top player, how many of the, the children actually, if they go into football, do beat the career that the dad had. It's very hard to do, you know, and it doesn't it's happen. Well, a lot. You've, got, you've got Justin Clivert. I don't think he's getting anywhere near Patrick's career. He, no. The one that's probably got closest is Kasper Schmeichel. Yeah. Hill, he's a, you know, he's not gonna he's not gonna emulate what Peter's done, but yeah. he's, he's got close, but still night and day. Really. Isn't so much Scottish, but if you you look at Archie Gemmell and Scott Gemmell as well. Yeah, you know, Scott's a, Scott's a good example for it. Goes on has a fantastic career. And I worked closely with Scott here at the Scottish FA, and, and we laugh at that. But again, he he laughs about it as well about always being referred to as Archie Gemmell's son and what Archie was for Scotland. You know, and it's incredible. And and you did. You, I, I felt that when I would as a young kid, you would feel that when you would go around places, and it was just incredible that for a young age that that put not you feel pressure, but almost there was an expectation of you would just be good, you would just go in and do it, you know, whereas there's a, there's a, lot, there's a lot more to it than, than just than just that, you know. So as I see, your, your career was in Aberdeen. At what point was it when you turned your head towards the coaching aspect of it? Yeah, so so I spent two years um, at Aberdeen and then unfortunately didn't, um, didn't get the contract extended after that. So come out of there and then moved into part-time football and I signed for Air United yeah. and had a couple of seasons at Air United and at that time um, luckily my, my middle brother who didn't go into full professional football he became a, a college lecturer and again gave me some great advice of um, maybe I should look and try and further my studies because I've come out of football school grades were, were probably bang average, not brilliant. So you're at that decision point, what do I do? Um, and lucky, just as football works, the one of the scouts who had brought me into Aberdeen was also a, a college lecturer at the time, a man called John Ward, who, if anybody listens for Scotland, is a, a well-known character across the west of Scotland. He was a top, top guy. And he worked really hard to get me into the college. Yeah. You know, and, and I'll, I'll never... Um, I'll always uh, thank him for that because it, it really did put me in a, a good pathway of got myself educated, uh, done my two years there to get a HND, went on to have a year at university and done a, that kind of three-year, um, so HNC, HND, a year's degree, you know, and I would never have had that unless John and, and my brother had pushed me to do it. 
and had given me the, the support to do that. So that that was massive for me. So I'd done that at the same time as as playing at um, or being involved, sorry, at United. How important do you think it is for the now we call it down here a dual athlete where you do try and have that balance? Mm-hmm. Because I know that in other sports it's quite common for somebody to do their yeah. sport and to to also be academic. I know it's a big thing in America, but in the UK, especially in men's football, it's kind of, I think all the eggs are put in one basket at a young age where they're hoping they're going to be a pro. I think it is, and it's something I think even the players themselves or the, the families of the players need educated on because it's so, you're only ever, you know, in touch with it, it never happens to kids, but they're only ever potentially a really bad injury away from, from their dreams being shattered or a manager makes a decision that they just don't fancy the player and they cannot really get over that, if that makes sense. And then that becomes a real tough, tough thing for them to deal with. So I think the education side of it is so, so important that you have that with it. If you could give one bit of advice now to a young aspiring goalkeeper, be it at grassroots level or even at academy level, what yep. would be your main bit of advice? Main bit of advice for me would be never give up. Yeah. Never give up and whatever you want to do, just you keep going for it. You never give up on it. You know, if somebody tells you you're not good enough, you make a mistake, it doesn't matter. It's what you believe yourself and you yeah. never give up on what you're trying to do. And uh, football is a fantastic industry that has so many routes for a career. Playing's one, you know, but if you have a chance of playing, great. If not, and you want to be involved in it, there's so many career opportunities within it. And coaching for me, has probably became the most successful route and it's been the best route for me, but you have to find that out yourself. But certainly never give up for me is the main thing. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. You know, you have to be very privileged and very lucky to make it as a professional footballer. And I think that's the reality of it. But you can't have a fulfilled career in the football industry. And there's so many different parts of it. Yeah. One thing I wanted to get an insight in, because I think it's really interesting with your background and your current role is, is there much difference in regards to the approach to coaching the women's goalkeepers compared to the men's goalkeepers, or is it a very similar kind of approach to what you would do in a session? I think the the first time I went with the women's squad, I had a sit down with the three goalkeepers at the time. Um, and I remember thinking, right, I'll need to approach this. And I try to approach it in the same way. And and to be fair, the three of them were great. So I sat down and says, look, this is the way I work. I'm very open. I'm very honest. I give you everything I can. Um, and I think they liked that. So in terms of how I approach it, my own personality, I remained the same. How open I am, the dialogue I have, the relationship that I try and build with the players was all there. And then through time, I think what I've learned is it's really just things of, Let's just say if I'm doing a, a set of six sets of four reps of something, yeah, I might just need to say, right, that actually becomes four sets of three for them. It's yeah. just, I think it's more the physical nature of things. The, that, that the loading would be quite different. Uh, basically, the loading, I think the the output, the, you know, the quality sometimes that they can provide for me is just as good, just as good. You know, that they're, they're still providing a very good quality within the session. And there is just small tweaks I find within just the physical side of it of maybe they can't jump as high. So yeah. then how do I then maybe alter the position so that that doesn't become a problem? So it's small things like that. Or they can't cover the goal as quick. Yeah. Fine. So how do I then improve their positional play to, to hide that that part of the game? And again, that, to me, that's, that's coaching. And... I wouldn't say it's a difference because you're still coaching. It's just a different way of coaching. You're looking. You're just coaching a different part of the, the goalkeeper's game. Um, but certainly, the, the only thing I would think is the the um, that physical loading side of it. I think is just a little bit different. Um, would be the areas for me. One of the main differences for myself, and I've been privileged to coach at quite a high level in the male and female game, is I always felt in the female game that communication was a little bit more key that we could have more yeah. the, the conversations we'd be able to have on the training ground were probably a little bit more in depth than I would have with one of the male footballers with the male with the, with the boys they were kind of they would just get on with it they would just do everything <laughs> they told them to do yeah. with the female players sometimes I'd have to give a little bit of a background of why we were doing this so they'd have a deeper understanding 
Yes, I'd agree with you. I, th I think sometimes in the women's game, you have to give more of an explanation. Here's the reason. You always give your why, whereas the men's game, it's just this is what we're doing when they get on with it. But I agree with you. I do find that the women's players are desperate to know more. They want to know more about it. They want to know all the intricate details and that. That's fine. I'm no problem with that. And uh, that is, I would agree with you. And you know, you find yourself explaining more or they'll ask more questions, yeah. certainly on, on the pitch. It's quite refreshing as a coach because sometimes <laughs> you're just kicking a ball at somebody and it's like, yeah. don't, they're not even interested. They're just going to save it. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, you know, if somebody's having an engaging conversation with you, I think the learning outcomes can be yeah. even better. Yeah, I agree. And it's a lot of the, some of the, the, the girls that we work with now and the, the women's national team. And there's uh, even just recently there with the three of them, Jenna, Lee and Megan Cunningham joined us. Megan Cunningham's very thoughtful as a goalkeeper and she's always asking and always trying to do this. And it's, you know, it is refreshing a coach because I was even going back to going, right, well, here's wee ways to try and help yourself back at club. And normally, international football, you don't get the opportunity really to, to try and develop them because you just don't have the time. You don't have the time to improve them. So so you're then looking at, and it was good, just Megan had wanted to know a couple of things about diving and you find yourself going away into coach mode and you're showing different things in the... You know, sometimes in the men's game, you'd never, that would never come up, you know. And just before we finish, again, a great result last night for the, the men's national team. Yeah. And Steve Clark seems to be doing an absolutely phenomenal job at the minute. How do you think Scotland can get on in the Euros this summer? I think, for anything, I think the one thing that, that Steve Clark has brought is, is a team who now have a lot more confidence and belief about themselves, but we're actually now a team that I, I think whoever we go and play against, I think we have now a chance because we, we seem to stay in games more. I think if you look at our game against Austria, can losing two goals to come back for that. Um, I think in the past, the team would have, it would have been a 2-0 defeat I don't, or a 2-1 defeat. You're not coming back twice. So I think that's something he's installed within within the group of a steeliness and determination that we don't get beat easily. So I think anybody who's playing against us will know, hopefully, that they're, they're in a game. They're in a tough game and it's it's just hopefully you need those wee bits of luck. I think a big thing's been Shea Adams. You know, I think now we've got a real degree. His goal last night was a fantastic goal. So I think that gives us now a real threat at the top of the pitch. Well, I think if you get a chance to speak to Steve, if you can ask him to give Steve Bruce a call, and let me know how to get the best out of Ryan Fraser as he looks <laughs> different player on his Scotland shirt, which is in the Newcastle shirt at the moment. What a hell last night. <laughs> Smallest guy in the pitch scores a header. So he's, he's flying in, in the Scotland colours, and I just hope he can replicate yeah. that in the, in the black and white. Yeah, he's been great in the games. He scored against Israel as well. Um, so, yeah, he's been. Yeah, I think he is a, a good he's a good foil for the likes of a Shea Adams and that when they play and he's got great energy and great attributes to play international football is paid and things Thank like that. Got some technical ability. Yeah, yeah, he is a very, very good player and again he's been he's been very good for Scotland recently. Brilliant. But thank you very much and we're, we're gonna wrap it up then. Just say thank you for your time. A great insight in your current roles and how he got into coaching and also as a youth player. And um I wish you the best of luck with your future endeavours with the Scottish national team and we'll speak to you soon. Brilliant, thank you. Best of luck to you all. Thanks a lot now. Take care. Bye-bye. Cheers.